I'd now like to introduce John Anderson and say uh, before I make the introduction that uh, we're going to have a little question and answer between John and me afterwards given his view, larger view of the engineering landscape. John L. Anderson has been president of the National Academy of Engineering since July 1st, 2019. He was born in Wilmington, Delaware and received his undergraduate degree from the University of Delaware in 1967, and his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1971, both in chemical engineering. Before NAE, John was most recently distinguished professor of chemical engineering and president from 2007 to 2015 of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Before that, he was provost and executive vice president at Case Western Reserve following 28 years at Carnegie Mellon University, including eight years as Dean of the College of Engineering and 11 years as head of the Chemical Engineering Department. John began his professional career as an assistant professor of chemical engineering at Cornell, where he was from 71 to 76. John was elected to NAE in 1992 for his contributions to the understanding of colloidal hydrodynamics and membrane transport phenomena. I'm uh, very appreciative of the fact that John and I have been professional colleagues and personal friends for more than 40 years, and we've had many, many interesting, enjoyable, professional, and social interactions over that time. So I'm very happy to have John with us here today and invite him to the podium to share his thoughts on engineering the small. John. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, we have uh, known each other for a long time. I've reviewed a lot of Matt's papers. I recommend the publication of all of them, but I'm not, <laughs> but I'm not sure he reciprocated. I have to find out. I had a, a couple of troubles with polymer papers that I was writing, so, uh, but uh, this is great, and it's a, a great honor to be here. And as the president of the uh, National Academy of Engineering, you understand that I'm really very happy to see this happen, uh, to see an engineering college established with definite goals and, and wonderful resources at one of the finest universities in the world that happens to be located in, in Chicago. So this is, this is just fantastic for us. I really got a kick out of uh, Tom Pritzker's story too of how, we, how you started this, Bob Zimmer, over a couple drinks in 40 minutes. And I was thinking, you know, that doesn't happen in Zoom meetings. So uh, you see the, the value of in-person face-to-face, -face, and I'm really pleased you went through with this uh, today. Um, you know, e engineering and science are very close to each other, but they're not the same. You kind of look at them as, uh, uh, let's say, non-identical twins with some, a lot of similarities, a lot of similar DNAs. All of us who are in, in the so-called engineering field uh, got interested, I think, because of science, but we saw other things, and, and uh, we complement one another. So uh, uh, you're, I think you're doing a great thing here, and I'll make a few comments as I go along, along today. Um, let's see, I've got to get this going. Is that work? Thank you. Um, engineering the small, you know, we think about engineering, uh, people think, well, the bridge, you know, if you don't do it right, the bridge is going to fall down, the Golden Gate Bridge, or the Dreamliner is not going to work. Or the uh, rover, Perseverance is, uh, you know, this is the ultimate engineering. Or we talk about robots, and uh, in this case, a spaceship, now called something else besides a UFO. I don't know what they call them now, but something else. Um, but uh, the little things are important because these big things are made of little things. There's systems on systems, systems of systems, so on. And uh, you ultimately get down to molecular scale. And that's where almost all failures occur. So, and that's where all creative things start. Um, the, uh, the robot one's interesting. Uh, for those of you, this is mainly aimed at people in the first three rows who are a little more a little older, you know? I mean, uh, uh, you, you can see the date of the movie. I, uh, I was born then, and I did see it uh, then. Uh, but the world, the day the Earth stood still, there's this robot called Gort, and he has companies and protects um, uh, Klaatu, who is a human 
Alien. Some of you may have seen this movie, they've had a remake of it. And anyway, Klaatu, he's supposed to protect, Gort's supposed to protect uh, Klaatu, but Klaatu gets, uh, get, is shot by the police. So then Gort's going to destroy the world, going to destroy all humanity, unless the actress, Patricia Neal, can say the right words. And the right words are uh, Klaatu, Barada, Nikto, the three most famous wor words in science fiction. And it loosely means, Klaatu is okay, don't kill everybody. That's, that's, that's what it means. And in fact, uh, uh, <laughs> the robot obeyed. I view this as the first evidence of uh, human computer interface and, uh, and machine translation. So, uh, you know, we talk about the big, but it's the small that gets us. This is from H.G. Wells' book, War of the Worlds, came out in 18. 87. This is the uh, a, a rendering by some um, journalists or artists back then. And the, uh, these machines that the aliens had were killing everybody and whatever, but at the end of, the move, at the end of it, the, Mar the Martians die uh, because they got a pathogen. I think assumed then to be a bacteria because they, a bacteria because they didn't have, they didn't know about viruses back then, okay. And uh, this, should so this should sound uh, uh, vaguely familiar, right? I mean, here we are, and we've got all these big things and all these things we can do, and a 0 0.1 micron particle freezes the world. So you just think about it, we haven't come all that far. Same thing in 1918. The, uh, the, uh, so I think that, um, unfortunately, we haven't learned as much as we'd like to think we've learned but I think what you're doing here today is on the right track to help us in these situations. So I'd like to talk about three things in the short time I have. What's different about small? It's more than just small. It's, there's, as you found out, quantum is one big thing that's different about small. But, this, but what is engineering? Why molecular engineering? And how can the Pritzker School have an impact on engineering? And that's, that's one of the things you're after. We look about uh, small. We start, we heard today about uh, uh, directed evolution and so on, Francis Arnold and uh, DNA, and you're talking about a certain size range of uh, 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 10 angstroms, 100 angstroms or so. And then we go to a virus, which is about a 0 0.1 micron, and uh, a polymer particles on electrodes, which is things I used to deal with the right hand from my lab on the right side, about one micron of bacteria are that size and so on. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about small. Uh, the difference is, though, is not just the size. It's, it's what, what uh, happens to them, how you control them. In fact, I had a question I wanted to ask uh, uh, Dr. Ferengi about how he does something with his small motors and so on. But for, for big, gravity is important. Things fall, they settle, you gotta keep them up. It's really important. Mass is important uh, there. Inertia is important, also due to mass. That is, if you push something that's big, if you stop pushing it, it keeps going. So you've gotta adjust it. Uh, Brownian motion's unimportant. The, the molecular mo molecules hitting it and all, it doesn't matter, really. It doesn't affect it. Chemical forces on big things aren't important. And if you want to arrange things that are big, you've got to mechanically move them, right? You have robots and so on, you move assembly lines and so on. Small, on the other hand, those isn't affected by gravity. There's no effect of inertia. That is, when you stop pushing on something small, it usually stops. Brownian motion is very important. Brownian motion is a double-edged sword. Uh, it's, it, it, the way little things move is by diffusion, okay, by Brownian motion thermal fluctuations. But if you don't want them to move, they still move. So like in the, with molecular motors, you've got to provide a force strong enough to overcome Brownian motion. So you have to think about those things. And chemical forces are extremely important, uh, as, you, as you heard today as well. And self-aggregation is important, things that uh, uh, Matt Terrell and his colleagues have worked on. So there's different things to learn. You know, curriculum is important, so there's different things as you, as you go along. What is small? 
Well, if you don't want gravity to have an effect in things like water, you have to be more, smaller than a micron or so, and so on. You can read down the list. Chemical forces operate in that 0.01 micron. Micron is about one one hundredth of a size of a hair, so it's still pretty small by itself. So these are the, the size ranges we're talking about. So now I want to address molecular engineering versus molecular science. What's the difference between these? And I get into these discussions quite often. Franz Cordova, had, I've had a few discussions when she was director of the National Science Foundation and was on the National Science Board and how, how we uh, uh, look at, it, at engineering. Uh, before I get into it, the, there, there is a story I want to tell about the difference that came to light to me recently. And that has to do with a scientist, the difference between engineering and science. A scientist and an engineer went hiking uh, in the wilderness, and at the end of the day, they pitched their tent, enjoyed dinner, and went to sleep in the tent. After a few hours, middle of the night, the engineer wakes, uh, wakes the scientist and says, look towards the sky, what do you see? And the scientist replies, I see millions of stars. The engineer says, what does that tell you? The scientist says, astronomically speaking, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Time-wise, it appears to be approximately 3.30 in the morning. And meteorologic meteorologically, it seems we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Then the scientist turns to the engineer and says, what does it tell you? And the engineer said, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> so you, you get a flavor for the difference right there. Right? <laughs> so what is engineering? Three slides on what is engineering. It's both a noun and a verb. In fact, you heard uh, Dr. Franklin talk about engineering and France. You're engineering things. You're doing things. So it's both a noun and a verb, action-oriented. It's derived from a Latin word that means ingenuity. It's not derived from a steam engine or an engine. It's, and in fact, if you think about it, engineer, the word for engineer starts with an E only in the English language. In the other languages, it starts with an I. It comes from the Latin. Right? I get this. I was educated with Howard Stone, who's a professor at Princeton. He used to be Harvard. He, he was interested in these kinds of, of things. Right? Secondly, Theodore von Karman, father of aeronautics, the first re recipient of the Medal of, of Science, by John Kennedy in 1962, said engineers create the world that never was. So it's about creating things. It's really engineering uh, uh, is, the, is the act of creating artifacts, processes, or systems that advanced technology. You can read the rest of that. The key words are creating. It's not just about problem solving, and I, I, try, I have to even emphasize that to members of the NAE. It's not just about solving problems. Who, who thought that we had a problem, we had, a, we had to invent the uh, smartphone? I mean, that wasn't the result of trying to solve a problem, or even a cell phone, or something like that. We're creating things to make society better, healthier, safer, and so on. Sometimes we have unintended consequences of what we create, but just trying to create things. And in my view, engineering, as someone who loves science, still loves science, and studied a lot of science, engineering is the expression of science on society. It's movement of some, into technology. It expresses science on society. Now, there's a fact is good engineering requires knowledge of scientific principles. This is recognized in the 40s and 50s, and the engineering curricula changed in this country greatly to emphasize science much more. Key words are design and systems. Science always, uh, uh, there's a myth here, science precedes engineering. Scientists discover something, and then engineers do something with it. It doesn't always work that way. You heard a lot of examples today by the three Nobel laureates about this, that, uh, that engineering people, like, especially Francis Arnold, you find out things, and then you have to go back, and a lot of science is created, scientific uh, uh, projects are created because things work, and you're not exactly sure why they work. So there's a synergy between the two, and there are arrows in both directions, and that's what makes it so fascinating. And sometimes engineers become scientists, and sometimes scientists become engineers. 20% of the 
2,500 members of the National Academy of Engineering have no formal degree in engineering. And so I think that's a, a really positive statement. And this is a great, uh, really a nice comment by a man named Steve Battelle, who's worked in the space industry, he's an NEA member, and he's an adjunct professor at Michigan now, and appeared in our periodical, The Bridge, uh, on space exploration. You can read that, but it really talks about the, the collaborative framework for engineering and science, it's a push-pull relationship. And that's what I think uh, President Zimmer was talking about today too, and Matt Terrell, about uh, uh, what this, this college can do. It, it can really be a connector to both the science and engineering worlds. Now, quickly on, uh, it stopped. I don't think I did anything. <laughs> I'm a chemical engineer. And I, uh, I wanted to skip. And technology is a misunderstood word. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I'm aiming at. Actually, point it up. Yeah, I see it. I don't know where I point this. Point it at you or? <laughs> um, Anna Harrison, a standing person. I never met her personally, but she had a great editorial about technology, science, and engineering. In 1984, she was the, at one time the president of AAAS and also the president of the American Chemical Society, professor at Holyoke College, a chemist, professor of chemistry there. But she talks, technology is the product of science and engineering. Uh, it, it's not a process, it's the product of what we do. 23, uh, the, the uh, ABET rec uh, recognizes 23 engineering disciplines. This, this little eye chart here shows you that mechanicals kind of got the most. Uh, but the important point is that the enrollment in engineering in these, these disciplines has doubled in the last 10 years. The enrollment, the bachelor, I mean, I'm sorry, the bachelor's degrees given, not the enrollment, the enrollment has doubled in 10 years. The, the um, enrollment in all bachelors, uh, in all fields, has only gone up 20% in 10 years. So engineering has really accelerated in terms of its, its intra, uh, uh, recruiting students. And these are the years that some of these fields were officially started. Now civil goes back uh, centuries, many centuries, maybe millennia, okay. But these are the years that a society was formed to support these disciplines. And I show this because you are starting something new. Are you starting a new discipline? And computer science is one of the newer ones, and biomedical engineering could have added that one on here as well. And there's a lot of similarities, in fact, between that and, 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 uh, uh, and what you're doing here in, in uh, molecular engineering. But computer science started in 47, and it's had a trajectory that's rather interesting. And uh, its, the, its organization, the Association for Computer Machinery, started in 1947. University of Chicago had something to do with the, this beginning as well. Uh, and you can see the progression here, uh, and down here, and it got accredited, and I'll talk about accredited for a few minutes later. Okay, in 1984, they started accrediting, accrediting computer science programs, and I'll discuss what ABET is. Finally, how many people know where a compute, the term computer bug came from? Nobody. Okay. It was, it, it's, it's actually a bug. In 1947, a woman named Grace Hopper, second woman ever at, uh, inducted into the National Academy of Engineering, she, she, she said, oh my God, a moth flew in and, fell, and, and, and its wing landed between in a relay so you couldn't get the zero or one. That's the source of computer bug when you see it now in a code. So if you remember nothing else in this talk, please remember that. And Grace was an outstanding person, uh, rear admiral in the Navy, developed COBOL language, a tr tremendous person. Right. So what is molecular engineering? And I took this from the a science article which you can now get digitally in archives in 1956 from Arthur von Hippel, and I think you've probably seen this, but you're building something from the bottom up, and I think that's the key to what you're, you're trying to do.
And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the next chart shows something rather interesting. And I took this from Wikipedia, and I'm sure you've, many of you have seen this, where you're doing molecular design, you move up the scale. But it's really a design process that you're into, and you're going to have to do a lot of science along the way to solve for these various, uh, to solve problems that will come up that you don't anticipate. The path, though, to a, a new program is, as we heard today, tortuous and, uh, and demand. But you have to look for various things, like is there a demand? Do, student, do we need to have a new program? Uh, new fields of study have high energy barriers. I know that uh, Mr. Pritzker said that they're, they're rel he said relatively low barriers between programs, but there's still barriers and there are turf issues, as uh, presidents know, uh, in, in universities. Uh, so you, 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 have to, you have to edge your way in. Um, curriculum, there needs some standardization of the curriculum if you're going to call yourself a discipline or an, an engineering. Uh, uh, discipline. Accreditation, certainly in engineering in the long run, and come back to that in a second. And persistence, the long haul. You've made it through 10 years. That's the hard part. It's still hard, but it gets a little bit easier because you've got some, some momentum, as we say, for big, for big things. Now, one question you might ask is, uh, well, here, I just, I, I, I looked at your, at your, um, catalog and on your website. And what really differentiates you here in a lot of ways is, is quantum, requiring quantum mechanics for engineering in the engineering college and the emphasis on quantum computing, quantum uh, phenomena. I think it's, so I think that this is a very nice structure. You're looking for fundamental courses. This is what defines you basically. You can have a lot of minors, a lot of other things, but your fundamental courses define what the discipline is that you have. This has been a problem for biomedical engineering that, that, because biomedical engineering was created by people from mechanical, electrical, chemical materials and whatever getting into uh, biomedical engineering. But uh, uh, figuring out what the core is was, was a real challenge. And broadening and individualized is important too, and you have tracks. So I was very impressed with what you've written up so far on, on this. So f getting to the end here, I'd like to ask, should, should eventually uh, the, the Pritzker School of Engineering look for some kind of accreditation? Now, sometimes um, People confuse accreditation with licensing and, and too much uh, restraint and whatever. Basically, engineering accreditation, and by the way, I'm not part of ABET. I, I'm not connected to it originally. I'm not a, and I led ABET evaluations, probably like many, some of you in the audience at other universities, uh, and it's, it can be painful, but, it's a, it, but the process can be also be rewarding internally, okay? Uh, but uh, should, should you be accredited? Well, ABET accreditation is really, or try to become accredited. It's really about minimum standards of education, but it's not a license. And it kind of defines what you are. You have to define in accreditation what you want to be, what you want your students to get. And then you have to show that you're doing it. That, uh, ABET doesn't say you have to do this, this, this. It says you have to define it. And almost all engineering programs have accredited programs. I think uh, Northwestern has nine accredited uh, engineering programs. All right. So it's something to consider in the future. Uh, but but why, why, why do it? Well, I think, um, uh, let's see what I have on the next slide here. I'm afraid to reverse it. What you, what you want to do with your accreditation is you're part of the community. And you want to have an impact. And the way you have an impact is by, by uh, collaborating with the accreditation board. And in the end, you want people to copy this program, not copy it exactly, but they want to be copied. And that, that's your success measure in the long run is, or other, do other, or other colleges of molecular engineering or even departments of molecular engineering creeping up uh, around the country. So in my concluding remarks, I'll just say congratulations, done a great job. Uh, 
President Zimmer is absolutely right. You can have a great plan, but you need great leadership, and you've had that, Matt, and the faculty. The talent here is incredible. You look up, I know many of the people that, that uh, have come here, and I think you're really well positioned to do great things. I think uh, it's important to connect and grow the undergraduate and graduate research programs and, uh, and send the message out. Make sure the message gets out and try to inspire other places to do something similar to this. Because I think it will catch on and I'm uh, very, very positive, sanguine about the future of what's going on. And finally, look at your legacy, the impact of, on other institutions and what's going on, uh, what, what they are doing and how they might um, uh, do something similar or even copy what you are doing. And to quote Wayne, Wayne Gretzky, I'm not a hockey fan, I don't, I never played hockey or whatever, but I always liked this one. Uh, they ask him, he said, skate to where the puck will be, not where it is now. And if you replace puck with education, I think uh, you'll get, you have the right answer here. So let me just make two, a couple concluding remarks. Uh, first, I have not discussed um, uh, ex uh, exp about expanding the reach of this program or any engineering to the broader community, in, in other words, more inclusivity, and we, uh, to all segments of our society. So I think we need to all work harder on that. I didn't have time to, to talk about that. Uh, I think the, this program, molecular engineering, will appeal to other all segments, to women, to underrepresented minorities. It's really fascinating, it's interesting, and I think you have a chance to bring in more of these people into the engineering field, the broader spectrum. The um, second thing I want to talk about is, say, is that I offer my congratulations again to Matt and what they've been able to do here, to President Zimmer and the faculty. I know the firsthand the limitations of power by a university president. You can't just wave a wand and get something done. It takes a lot of uh, convincing and vision to do it, and I thank him and uh, Tom Pritzker, of course, for doing this. Uh, and doing it in 10 years, that may seem like a long time, but that's lightning fast in academic time frames. And I am certain that uh, this bet on molecular engineering will pay off in terms of impact and legacy for the university. 10, 20, 30 years from now, the University of Chicago will be recognized for what started here and feel very good about its decisions. Thank you. So, so, so the idea is, uh, certainly if there are questions from the audience for John and I to spend a few minutes on these oh, okay. chairs, so please. Um, and we have people that can bring you a microphone. I have one. Uh, not you, uh, people oh. in the audience. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I can't see very well because of these bright lights in my eyes. So yeah. is, is there anyone who would who'd like to pose a question? You know, I was going to, uh, to, to actually bring up the question of accreditation. Uh, in a different way, you know. I mean, I get asked every once in a while by parents of students who are thinking about coming here, you know, is this accredited? And I, I kind of blow off that question, you know. I don't think not being accredited is going to uh, diminish the students' career opportunities really at all. But you brought up another point that I never thought of, which is, you know, if we do want to be influential on other education institutions, accreditation might be. Uh, might play a role in that. So, I mean, I understood you correctly, right, in, yes, in that regard. You, we're talking about undergraduate degree, not the graduate, yeah, the, the yeah. master's degree. Yeah, it's not, a, a, the students that graduate here are really bright and, and accreditation is not going to matter to them. And maybe if they got into the public, some kind of public uh, works. I did know uh, when I was at Cornell, the best student they ever had, he still holds a record for the highest GPA. Uh, he, he, did, he had a non-accredited degree, and they couldn't, they hired him, but they had to fire him four months because they found out his degree wasn't accredited. He worked for the state of New York, but that's a rare occasion. I, I think the reason you'd want to be accredited is you can have influence on the field. That's the reason. It, it, yeah, sort of influence in the, um, 
organization and way the field runs, you know, I mean, you can have influence in the field by your ideas, well, of course. It's, it's, like, it's like publicity, too. Yeah. I mean, it's basically yeah. publicity as well. And uh, you talked about your next 10 years or 20 years or whatever, and I applaud you. Great, great plans. I read that. And I think uh, going for accreditation gets you more in, uh, uh, more in the limelight that way mm -hmm. in, among, the, among uh, the engineering community. The other thing it does uh, is it, it forces introspection. You have to keep asking yourself, what are we trying to do here, and what do we want our students to have when they leave? So it's really two purposes. Those are the two purposes. I think where I've been, like at Carnegie Mellon, we didn't, we didn't have to be accredited uh, in our fields. Northwestern students don't have, to, don't have to have it, but to have an influence and uh, to force yourself to, do, to have introspection, that's what you need it for. So, like I said, I can't really see if there's questions, but somebody tell me, France, please, right down here. Lakeisha. We want everybody to hear, though, France. So. We have a microphone. It'll be right there. <laughs> so. Thanks. Uh, thank you. So this is a really interesting question because, you know, John, you showed that uh, histogram with all the different fields of engineering, all the, all the little silos. And so just a question that would pop up in my mind is just, does that, that mean that molecular engineering will be siloed into one of those bins when the, the whole idea is for it to cross to mix it all up and, and really strike out a new territory. And if it were just in, in a world that didn't care so much about accreditation, I'd say being unique and being interdisciplinary among, with engineering and science and you know, the technology, the whole thing, is just much more interesting to me as a student coming into an environment like that. It's just an opinion. That, that, that's a good question, Brent. Uh, but I don't think so. Uh, some programs, for instance, engineering science at some universities is, is accredited, is very broad. And I think molecular engineering is very broad. Uh, everything depends on molecules eventually. So, uh, so I think that uh, now you can avoid, you want to avoid that and, uh, and, 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 and just call it molecular engineering, which covers all these things that, that Matt's been talking about. Uh, but it's only siloed if you let it silo you. you. Again, I go back, accreditation means you define what you want to be and then you have to show you're doing it. That's basically what it means. Well, let me ask you another question that's been on our minds that relates to publicity, and that's rankings. Oh. Uh, we've been trying to figure out when or if we could enter into the rankings of uh, engineering programs. And you know, we have pretty good statistical uh, people here in oh, the yeah, administration. Great yeah, yeah. So we can, you know, we, we know what the US news algorithms are and we can sure, guess. You can play but, that one, yeah. But you know, you know, the best we can hope for right now is you know, coming in in the 20s or something like that because of the combination of intensive and extensive variables. You know, some yeah. things in that ranking that are weighted just depend upon how big you are your total yeah, research uh, dollars. Harvard had the same situation, uh -huh. right? I mean, they, 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 had, uh, they had a college of engineering, and I think they're in the same, except that when you think about University of Chicago and Harvard, you don't, I mean, so what if Harvard's <laughs> 20th in engineering? I mean, you're talking about the best universities in the world. So, uh, uh, you know, and that's the problem with those rankings, um, and it, it, it's really distorted, in some sense prostituted the, uh, educational uh, way we do things. I, uh, I, I, um, I, I shouldn't worry about the ranking. I think if you do the right thing over a long period of time, you're going to be in great shape. You've got a great university. You've got a great start. So I wouldn't be uh, worried about it. Now, I don't think they're going to rank you because you molecular engineering has nothing to be ranked against, right? You talk about, you talk about a college of engineering, right? Right, yeah. right. Um, those are the ones that are done by weighted uh, algorithms. And yeah, we, I've been yeah, asked the yeah. last uh, I, three uh, years. I hadn't thought about that. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know what to, to tell you. If the board of trustees would be upset if you come in, if you don't come in the top three or four uh, on that. But, I, um, but, but I, I just hate to see rankings distort what you're trying to do, you know. So.